Frankie! Hello. Mate, we're back. We're back for another and week. I was actually just commenting on your shoes. Yes, yeah, very give us a Give us a look at them. Mate, these are just back on the... Uh... The navy blue They're your Nikes. wife's, aren't they? Not my wife's, no, they're men's. Oh. <laughs> Mate, they're very... What about you? Your pink socks, are they your girlfriend's? <laughs> Mate, they're nice, huh? Flamingo socks, of and course. And that shirt, you've still got the uh, the stain on it from dinner last Friday no, night. No, That's no, garlic I'll, I'll bread wash, on the I'll front, isn't it? it in between, mate. <laughs> it's been through the cycle. That's your going out shirt, isn't it? Yeah, one of. <laughs> <laughs> See, folks, that's the biggest lesson you're going to get out of this podcast. When you have lots of cash, the the way that you get there is you spend very little. They're on, they're on the sale rack, weren't they, those shoes? No, no, mate. They were quite expensive, actually. I'm trying to help the inflationary causes, mate. Are I'm you? trying to keep inflation down by not spending. That's, that's the lesson right. of the week. Just save You want inflation it. to come down? Stop spending, people. Well, mate, the way to stop spending is just carry as much debt as I do, and then it just evaporates all of your disposable income as the interest rates yeah, go up. You've got no choice. Well, that's the aim, mate. That, that's what they're trying to do. So, mate, it's working. Very much so. It's very much working. Now, Frankie, today what we're going to talk about is something that you and I have been very good at throughout our uh, investing journeys, your investing journey over the last 70 years and mine. 70 <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're going in dog years now, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and mine over a, a shorter period of time. But it's about leveraging equity, and you know, at the end of the day, being able to maximise the bank's money essentially, and and what I call fake money, because at the end of the day, <laughs> it's not really real, right? It's, well, it's numbers on a bit of paper or numbers I don't think on you a ever see the real cash, but it's the the numbers are there in the bank account. But it's very very good. It's very good, and uh, to be honest, it's a it's it's something that a lot of um, normal mum and dads or, or, or people who maybe buy one property and then sell it and buy another one don't really understand how it works mm. and how to leverage equity and um, why actually growing your equity is the fastest way to be able to get to passive income as opposed to trying to earn a little bit of income along the way and pay down the debt. Yeah, I think, look, uh, the most, you know, let's call them mum and dad investors understand that, yes, you can go out, you know, the bank will lend you up to 80% of the value of a property, but then... You know, that property grows in time to mm. say over five to 10 years. You've now, and not quite understand what equity is and how you can leverage that equity without actually needing to sell the property. That's right. A lot of people think that obviously they save the deposit for their first property and the only way that they can buy their next property is either to save another deposit or to sell that property down, realize, realize the, gain, the cash, yeah, the gain, and then use the cash again for a deposit. That's right. Um, and it wasn't taught back in the day. No, you know, when well, they don't you, teach you this stuff in school. Maybe they should. When you were going to school, <laughs> I mean, they well, they wouldn't have had computers. You were probably still. <laughs> they did. It was this is not a joke. Homing, <laughs> homing pigeons. <laughs> Definitely no computers. And uh, well, computers came in yeah later in. Was uh, it still high horse school? and cart when you were going to no, school? Not no, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, essentially, what? Well, let's define equity um, if, from from a property perspective. Um, essentially, equity is the gap between what your current mortgage is on the property and if you have a mortgage and the v- actual value of the asset or the banks, what the bank values the asset at. Yep. That gap is your equity, which is essentially you know, what they calculate to, to, to generate your net worth, which is what yep. your net asset value is. Uh, obviously, net asset value being gross assets minus all of your debts or liabilities and then getting you that net number. Uh, and then you know that's your that's your net worth essentially. Mm. So the the equity is the gap between the the mortgage and the the property value. Um, we can't access one hundred percent of that. The banks, no. if we if so, we there's want. equity and then there's usable equity. Yeah, that's right. The usable usable equity is obviously eighty percent of for the for the most part. Yeah. yeah, for the majority of people, you can access up to eighty percent of a property's value. And uh, let's hypothetically say you've got a million dollar property or a property that's valued at a million dollars. You've got uh, a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage on that property that, yeah. uh, that you may be paying down. Um, essentially, you can access eighty percent, which means that'll allow you to access up to eight hundred thousand dollars. Of that property, and the gap between your current mortgage being five hundred thousand and that equity value being eight hundred thousand will allow you to access that three hundred thousand of grand. usable equity, which essentially still means then you've got two hundred thousand of equity in the property, but you can't touch that yeah. because that's the, the bank's buffer. And with that three hundred grand, you take that as a deposit on maybe one, maybe two, maybe three exactly. additional properties. Exactly right. So when that with that three hundred thousand, you know most brokers or bankers. Um, 
will, will tell you to do a thing called an equity release. And, uh, and what that essentially is, is the bank going, okay, here's the $300,000 in equity. They will give you that as essentially a cash out amount. They'll put put it in, you know, a cash. Well, it's a separate loan. Yeah, that that's right. It's, it's cash loan. of which you then use that cash for a deposit. Um, some bankers or, or some brokers will uh, will do a thing called a cross collateralization where they oh. use that equity to collateralize um, or as collateral, I should say, uh, for the other property, which means both of those properties essentially locked together. Um, obviously get advice on this from a broker or a banker or, or someone in the finance world. But for you and I, that's not how we do it. We get equity release loans or cash outs and we you then use that cash as the deposit. So essentially what happens then is you go from having a $500,000 mortgage on that property to an $800,000 mortgage. Probably they'll be split into two loans, one yeah, of 500, get, one of 300. You get a loan split because the purpose is quite different. Like that original $500,000 loan, let's assume that was the original loan amount and you hadn't paid anything down, could have been for your principal place of residence where the equity release of the additional 300000 might be for your first investment property. So the purpose is quite different. That's right. One has now become an investment debt, which is tax deductible, and uh, the other is non-deductible debt. That's right, yes. So you've got $800,000 of debt now against that one property, and then you use that 300000 that you've cashed out as the deposit for the next property um, or to split them, you know, we multiple deposits, them, yeah. like you said. Um, and essentially what this means is the only property that you really have to save cash for is the first property. That's right. Yeah. Any property after that then just becomes about recycling equity of which that property is generating. And this is why we're so big on not paying down debt, mm. but trying to actually increase your debt levels because as you increase your debt levels with assets like property that grow in value, what you're essentially increasing is your ability to be able to grow your wealth. Because if you've got debt which is attached to properties, the more debt you essentially have usually means the more property that you own mm. or the larger the, uh, the value of the property that you own. And as we know, properties grow in value over the long time. So if you've got a million dollars in property growing at 10%, you're making 100 grand a year. If you've got $5 million in property growing at 10%, you're making 500 grand a year. Yeah, and, and I've spoken about this before about you know even in my own property journey, yes, your first, second, th- sort of third property is the hardest but once you've got three properties in the market and and that could be split across three different states and they could be a combination of houses and units but let's just talk about property in general when you have three properties in the market growing and they might not might not all grow at the same time but that's a hell of a lot of equity or capital growth that you are creating as opposed to just having one and like we said from the equity you release out of let's just say two properties or three properties it means you can quickly leverage into property number four five and six and and it creates a snowball effect and you know once you then got five or six properties now this is all obviously subject to affordability and servicing criteria Mm. but let's just say you you have the income to support this um wow then you've got five six properties growing and and you can really you know it's the compound effect it is a compound effect yeah and and being able to leverage your equity is the fastest way to actually get to a passive income so i think the misconception out there is let's buy a property that's positively cash flowed the theory is that positive cash flow will pay down the debt and eventually the positive cash flow because every dollar we pay down generates more positive cash flow because you've got less debt. Yeah. Eventually, that positive cash flow will pay the debt down to zero and I have a property that's unencumbered. Hopefully, it's grown in value and now I've got the income that comes off that. Yeah. But what we find is, and we find this with our own owner-occupier properties, is it takes us a very, very long time to pay down debt. That's right. Most mortgages are 30 years and you pay that down over a 30-year period and at no time during that 30-year period do we think, wow, our mortgage is so cheap. Because usually (laughs) we stress ourselves to a point where we're like, fuck me, mortgage takes a majority of my surplus income. Yeah. So it takes a long time to to pay it down to zero and some people never get there. No. But what we know is what what, what happens much faster is that property growing in value. So let's use that same $500,000 example. That $500,000 property, let's say that we we bought it, we got a $500,000 loan and that $500,000 loan is now 30 years. Standard loan term, you've got 30 yep. years to pay that down and if you're spending 500 grand, that 500,000 is probably going to, you know, what, take 50, 60% of your income usually, your surplus income? Yeah, depending on what rates are. Yeah. So it's going to take you 30 years to pay that down to zero, which means... If to get to a, a passive income of having zero debt, well, if, thirty years. Let's just say you started at twenty. You're now fifty. That's right. That's your whole investing journey just about done. Exactly. You, but during that time, the same property is probably gone for five hundred thousand to one and a half to two million over thirty years. Even more. Yeah. Hypothetically, you know what you've probably seen this in your time. Yeah. You've been investing for thirty years. Yeah. Well, I haven't. 
I haven't held a property for 30 years. Um, yeah, but you know. But I, what would that same $80,000 apartment you bought be worth now? I think I looked it up. I think it's worth close to 500000 There you go. So in 30 years, it's gone from eighty to 500000 That's yeah. five X to its value. So let's yeah. use that on a $500,000 property. That same property is worth $2.5 Yeah. So in the time it's taken you to pay 500000 to zero, that property has gone from five hundred to two and a half million. Mm. So it's five X to its value in the same time that it's taken you to pay down to That's zero. Right. You, there's, there is no way you can possibly save as quickly as capital growth can eventually. Exactly. So if that's the case, instead of trying to make a small amount of income over the journey, because the reality is you need to get to, if you're uh, trying to replace your income with a passive income target, um, it's going to take you a long time to be able to do that through well, just to, trying to multi- pay down debt. You need multiple properties, don't you? So our, our concept and what's worked for you and, and what I'm on that journey doing is let's not worry about paying down any of the debt. Because, and I've said this online before and people say, no, that's wrong. <laughs> it, it costs somewhere between 75 to 100% more to pay P&I on a property than interest only. Mm. And what I mean by that is it doesn't cost 100% more from an actual mortgage repayment standpoint. Your mortgage doesn't go from three grand a month to six grand a month. No. The 100% difference is what an interest only payment is, is say three grand a month. And let's say the rent on that is around about let's say 2,800, three grand a month. So it's yep. costing you $200 a week. Mm. P&I repayments make that $3,000 mortgage go from 3,000 to say 3,600. So the gap then is another $600 of which you've got a cash flow. Yes. So it's an extra 100% of cash flow out of your pocket, not necessarily mm. the whole mortgage. And people go, oh, but you know that it's paying down principal. When are you ever going to pay down the principal? That's a whole nother thing. A hundred percent. And, <laughs> and so, so we say, instead of using that extra three or 400 bucks a month to pay down the principal on the property, use that extra three hundred, three to $400 a month to go and service one more $500,000 property yes. on interest only. Because if one $500,000 property was costing you two or $300 a month to hold, for example, these are the example numbers, mm. then two properties would cost you $600 a month, yep. which is the same as paying one property of P&I. Of P&I, that's right. And now you've got two in the market that are growing in value. That's right. And if we know that a $500,000 property grows to two and a half million over a 30 year period, that means two properties would go to five million over that same period. Yep. And it's costs exactly the same amount of money than it would if we owned one five hundred thousand dollar property and paid that to zero over thirty years. But we still years. haven't paid down any principal, Jack. What about that? That's right. <laughs> so if we have one property over thirty years, pay it down to zero, we've got now two and a half million dollars of equity or unencumbered asset. Because we yep. paid it down to zero and it's grown to two and a half million. No debt. But let's say we did the, the strategy where we buy two properties, pay no debt down. So we still at the end of the 30 years have a million dollars in debt between the two properties. Yep. But we've got $5 million now in, in gross asset value. So let's hypothetically say we sold one of those properties down. So we sold a $2.5 million property down, paid off the million dollars in debt that we have. So yep. we're left with now net $1.5 million in cash plus a $2.5 million property that has no value. We've now got $3.5 million of net worth with exactly the same scenario by paying exactly the same cash flow out of pocket for the last 30 years mm. and we're $1 million richer. So which would you prefer? Exactly, exactly. And the debt becomes irrelevant over 30 years. You know, 500 grand on, on two and a half million, it's, it's irrelevant, so to speak. Um, you know, your LVR has dropped to, to 25%. <laughs> exactly. Um, versus, you know, where it first started. So, And that's the whole thing about leveraging equity. So instead of paying everything down to zero or worrying about using the cash flow in the short term to give you little drips and drabs, have a little bit of delayed gratification and to work out what what is your passive income target. And let's say it's $100,000 a year. Yep. Um, if it's $100,000 a year, you need $2 million in, mm. uh, in net assets or cash to give you 100 grand, 5%, 5% roughly, yeah. net. Um, so what's the fastest way to get there? Is the fastest way to get there to be able to buy... A property, pay it down to zero and let it grow to that level. And if we use the um, if we use the example like we just did with the half a million growing to two and a half million, work out what that does. Or is it faster to buy, buy two properties, pay down no debt, get to a certain point, sell down one asset, pay down the debt on the other, and then turn that from a growth focused strategy into a cash flow focused strategy. And that's what we that's what we do. Yes. It's how much growth do we need to get to a point to go, okay, now I've got my passive income target. And numbers are different for every single person. But if your target is half a million dollars a year, you work that out. What is my net asset value you need to be? Bang, what does it look like if I try and pay the debt down over time? What does it look like if I just leverage up, let those properties go from X to Y over that same period of time, sell down some assets? Oh, you got to pay capital gains tax of 22.5%. <laughs> Big whoop. 
you know, and then uh, and then live off the passive income. Yeah. And that's all, all that whole strategy is just around leveraging equity, leveraging equity. Yeah. And I think the important thing there is, um, you know, you don't need to sell the asset to realize the capital gain. Like we said, the bank will lend you up to 80% of the property's value. So leverage that equity. Yes, you can't, you know, if you sold the property, you would access 100% of the of the equity. Mm. But geez, being able to access 80% of it is, is pretty damn good. Absolutely. Um, so, let, you know, keep the asset. Because as soon as you sell that asset, yes, you, you access that extra 20%. Um, but you've lost the future capital growth of that asset. You've lost the rental income. And all you're going to go, you, you're now going to pay some capital gains tax. And all you're going to do, you know, if that's your aim, is to take that capital gain and go and reinvest again. Exactly. So why go through the transactional costs of, of selling, you know, what hopefully is a good asset in a good location, leverage up to 80%, take the money, use it as a deposit for number two or number three. And over time, you, though number two and number three will create equity and, and you go again. Exactly. And, then and it actually think- becomes easier. I found it actually, the more properties I had, the the easier it was. Once, one, I was more experienced. And two, like I said, once I had three, four, five properties in the market growing, wow, you went through a boom period and, and literally you're making, you know, a million dollars in equity in, in a year or two. Mm. And then you've got, then equity's not an issue. It's affordability and serviceability. That's you know, right. That's, that's the other side of the and, equation and, as we and know the, of. The, the, the pendulum swings, right? Like a lot of people would have known a time where equity was what banks really cared about and they mm. didn't really care about servicing, right? Where now it's swung the other way. You can have millions of dollars worth of equity, yeah. but if you don't have an income, they won't lend you any money. That's right. And that's bound to change again. You know, yeah. that's bound to swing another way. So it's all about just being in the market for a long period of time. And at each point in the journey when you're going to buy or, or when you're going to, you know, change tunes, you need to assess the market at that point in time. Um, and, and like you said, you get more experience, you talk to more people, you understand things in more detail. And usually when you do that, you can you can access more stuff, right? Because yeah. when you are at a novice level or a beginner level of education and knowledge, you access novice and beginner products. Well, and, and You know, time is key. Like we said, if you've got 30 years to invest, that's that's fantastic. Um, you know, because the, the longer that you're in the market, the longer the more capital growth you're going to, to realize. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, you know, for your first, you buy your first property, then you might have to wait for that growth for your second. Then you might have to wait again for your third. But like I said, once you've got four or five in the property, your wait is actually shorter to get to your, you know, number six, seven, and eight. Because, That's right. Because if you've if, got multiple properties growing. And even if they're growing. only growing at 5%, oh, that, 5% across the whole portfolio gives right. you another deposit. You don't have to wait till you're getting 10 to 15 to 20% growth. You only need 5% on each of them and suddenly you've got enough equity there to say, hey, I've got now another deposit for, for property number four. Or five. And that's happening right now. Like I, if everyone thinks the last twelve months have had no growth, but I went and valued all the properties that I could. Mm. Bang, another deposit. I'm not going to spend it on another property right <laughs> now. But um, you know, there's another yeah, deposit. It doesn't take there. much. It doesn't take much. And you know, that, what that's what I've realised that having multiple properties in the market growing, they don't have to grow that. You don't have to have a boom. You could just be getting a nice, you know, a steady three to four to five to six percent growth per annum. Um, and you know. As we know that anywhere around the Australian property market, what's the average six to six and a half percent? So you know, even if you're only getting four to five percent in the quiet times, the boom times will come at some stage during a ten-year period. You'll get that eighteen months to twenty-four months of boom, um, and that's really then when you've, you've got four properties in the in, in the market, you're going to see some real quick growth in in uh, in equity. Um, but yeah, in the quieter times. You only need to see three to five percent, and and you've got enough deposit to go again. Exactly right. And then when you get to that stage of okay, now I've got enough, it's time to to kick back, like you're essentially doing now. <laughs> there's many different ways to do it. Like I was speaking with a a good friend and and a, and a mentor recently, um, and he was talking about well, he's at a stage now where he's not really doing a great deal inside of his business. He has you know twenty five odd million dollars in assets was carrying a relatively low level of debt on that, like circa 10 million. Yeah. And uh, which essentially means he's got, let's say he's got 10 properties all valued at two and a half million each. And they've got a million dollars in debt on each of those properties. Um, he, you know, he said to a few of the lenders, well, you've got an asset that's worth two and a half with $1 million worth of debt. Let's yeah. say you've got three of those. How about I leverage up 80% on two of those assets and take the title deed back on another one? Okay, yeah. So now you've got an unencumbered, you've still got the same level of debt, but yeah. now you've got an so unencumbered asset. So they just restructured asset. it across the, th- the- that's right. So now properties. all of a sudden exactly. you haven't actually paid the property off, but you've been strategic in a way where you've had three properties that have grown in value 
across those three, if you leverage two of them back up to 80% mm. and use the equity off those to pay down the debt of the other one to zero, now you've just got a property that's unencumbered yeah. and you actually haven't paid the debt off. You've just you've just moved a few numbers on a that's page right. in you a screen. Restructured, you've restructured it, haven't you? Which now means that that's sitting there in the side. So if something ever happens, no one can come and you know Take have any recourse you. on yeah, that because right. it's got no title deed on it. And then you can be even more strategic and go, okay, well, if I haven't got great serviceability right now, I've got a property with zero dollars debt. There's a lot of private lenders out there that'll give you 56% leverage, mm. on, on, capitalize the interest and give it to you for a 10 year period. You go and access, you know, 50% of two and a half million, they'll give you $1.25 million in cash. Right. They'll, it'll be a, a big interest rate to yeah. be able to do that. But the interest rate's just got to be less than what the property's growing in value for of you course. to get to the end of that period and then sell it down and be in exactly the same net position. Yeah. Plus then you've just got 1.25 million in cash to be able to, to play with. So in that scenario, and this is obviously getting very sophisticated, yeah. But in that scenario, two and a half million dollar property, the private lenders give you 50%, so you've got 1.25 million in cash. They're probably gonna charge you, let's say they're gonna charge you 10%. 10. So it's 125,000 a year they're, they're charging you, but you've got a two and a half million dollar asset in the marketplace growing at say 7%. So you're making 200,000 in growth. You're still $75,000 net better off. Yeah. Over the next 10 years, you, you've got to spend that money before they're gonna want their principal paid back and their interest. You've lived on $125,000 a year of net income, which is a like earning 170, 180, because you've lift off the equity. Yeah. You get to the end of the 10 years, that two and a half million dollar property now is probably worth five. five. <laughs> You've now got uh you know two and a half million dollars on debt. You could potentially do that again. And that's yeah. the living off equity strategy. Ah, yes. So and the way that the living off equity strategy works best is when you've got a long runway. So living off equity doesn't work as well when you've only got, say, two to three years worth of equity sitting in the bank. So mm. let's just say you've got that same example, two and a half million dollar asset. Uh, you've got, you know, a million dollars of debt on that. That million dollars of debt costs you 60 grand a year to hold. And let's say you've got $200,000 of, of equity that you've released from that property sitting in offset. That's only three years worth of servicing on that property, right? And let's sure. say you come out in a time like this, you can get stuck. And yeah. when you get stuck, you might have to sell an asset. But let's say that you've got 10 years worth of buffer sitting in an offset account of which you're living off. Mm. You've got time. You can work out when is the right time. When are the banks easier to you know, get money off? Yeah. Um, you know, when is when are the interest rates slightly lower? So you can time all these things because you've got such a long period. So, so essentially, you've got, you've got more choice. You've got more financial freedom to you know, either muck around with restructuring like that and, you know, living off equity if that's what you want to do. Or like you said, just, uh, you know, go again, purchase another one or like you said, um, restructure so you can have one. Mate, there's, there's so many strategies out there. And the great thing about living off equity is that it's tax-free money. You yeah, know? that's true. You pay interest on the money, but it's mm. tax-free. You tax when you're earning... 180 yes. pluses. You just can't use the interest the as a tax deduction if you're living off it there. That's right. It's, it's not, not for not investment, investment purposes. purposes. But you can be a little bit creative with that. So for example, <laughs> what you could do, this is not financial advice, um, you could use that equity to go and invest it into go something buy shares, which, which, that, which is called debt recycling, which yes. then pays you an income. That's right. The, and the shares are an investment. That's yeah. right. So that the, it the does then come tax deductible. Excellent. You could then, you know, that income needs to be dispersed into, you know, a family trust or something like that. Yeah. Family trust then disperses the income out. You could disperse it to you know three or four different people paying the eighteen thousand tax free threshold, <laughs> and all of a sudden you've got tax free income. There you so go. there's many different ways to skin a cat, and obviously you know, the, the right experts can can give you the advice on this. Um, but the the thing that we need to, to understand here is it all starts with leveraging your equity. It all starts with buying a Definitely. property, having that property grow in value leveraging the gap between the mortgage and what the bank will lend you so the usable equity which is 80 percent of the property's value and then recycling that into another property and into another property you know and if you the properties are performing well you know there's no reason to sell them don't sell them like i always say yeah i could sell some properties now and pay off all my debts but the properties are pretty much paying for, them, for themselves now and you know, as soon as I sell a property, I lose the potential, the future capital growth, and I and I lose the rental income. Mm. So then I've got a issue of what am I going to do with this cash now? Come stick right. it in a term deposit at five percent. You could go and buy eighteen thousand <laughs> pairs of those some shoes. New shoes. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> what, what's the pain for themselves? You know, I don't necessarily. I've got to a stage now where I've consolidated. I, I'm really not looking to purchase another property, although I may in my self managed super fund. <laughs> I'm just learning a bit more about that. Um, you know, just let them do their thing now. Just 
let time continue to roll on and let the capital growth continue to grow. That's it. And keep wearing those blue polka dot shirts, Frankie, and those <laughs> uh, those shoes. Where are they from again? You said Millers. No, man, Nike's Nike. Direct from the direct from Nike. All right, Jack. That's, that's it. Mate, it's good to see you. <laughs> Very good. Thanks All for right. coming. Good stuff. This is general advice and does not take into consideration your objectives, situation, or needs. You should consider if this advice is suitable to you or your circumstances, and please read any applicable PDS beforehand. This is a Henderson podcast production.